Welcome to the Clean Mobility panel. Uh, my name is Bill Bonnet, and I'm joined by four esteemed panelists. Uh, we're going to start with an initial five-minute presentation from each of you. which is based on a triple business line. It's a unique startup, world's first pilgrimage as a service platform, offsetting the Makkah city pilgrims carbon footprint by quasi pilgrimage. Uh, what is quasi pilgrimage or we call it in Arabic Umrah al-Badal. It says that you don't have to travel to Makkah to do a holy pilgrimage. The mobility doesn't happen, but it is virtual pilgrimage. So we are disrupting the mobility and the transport sector by creating jobs virtually that is outsourcing pilgrimage to the Makkans who live in Makkah uh, when they are performing pilgrimage it will be streamed live it is 25 percent of the actual cost once the pilgrimage is done we perform uh, we plant 51 trees uh, which is actually required to offset the amount of carbon reduced in an Umrah pilgrimage uh, if you see this particular slide, uh, this is the carbon footprint, the whole black. The CNN had carried a very big research paper on that. The most effective way to tackle climate change is plant 1 trillion trees. And if you see the quarter from the Africa to Sub-Sahara and Saudi Arabia, that black area is where the carbon footprint is. So our aim is to offset the carbon footprint. Our our mission is to provide an eco-friendly Pumra pilgrimage, deliver real-time experience, and go with trillion trees. Uh, and we are the world's first pilgrimage as a service platform, a blue ocean strategy where there is no one in the pie, and we hope to carry forward. Uh, we have been referred to as Uber on demand, Pumra on demand by none other than Reuters. Uh, this is our business model. Uh, we, we are uh, based on the uh, for the economic front, we are creating foreign exchange and jobs in uh, Saudi Arabia for the Saudi youth. On the environment front, we are offsetting the carbon footprint. And on the technology, we are going with digital transformation in the new or normal. So if you see that the mobility part is being uh, disrupted, but at the same time, there is benefit to the environment, economy, and the society as a whole within the local uh, city of Makkah. Uh, this is people, planet, and profit, where we are addressing the three P's of sustainability. Uh, the fifth level, achieving the fifth level of tra transcendence, once everybody's needs, this is the Maslow's hierarchy of startups, which we should call. We say that once all the needs are done, 1.7 billion Muslims across the world want to come to Makkah and perform a holy pilgrimage, but only 14 million currently are performing. Out of that, 9 million are transient and 5 million are locals. So there is a huge demand and supply gap. We are addressing that. This is our uh, available on App, Apple Store, or App Store and Google Play. Uh, there are seven, eight actually sustainable development goals which we are addressing and we presented them in the united nations as well these are the stgs that we are addressing so last um, minute last minute okay the carbon footprint is offset like this this is how we are planning the trillion trees this is the umrah target these are the years this is the sales progression and this is the trees progression we give one dollar for every tree so every umrah gives 51 dollars to any farmer from any faith uh, this is how we offset the carbon footprint 10 million umrah is the vision for 2030 0, 0 0.5 billion contribution to the planet earth and our solution is implemented this is our pr this is our at the united nations assembly we intervened and uh, discussed about it this is the pr and the media this is the team our ceo and myself thank you very much thank you Noman, very much uh, perfect. Thank you for sticking to your time. Nico, you're next. Hello from the Netherlands. Uh, I'm Nico Anten. I'm the chairman of Connect, which is a Dutch uh, foundation with over 500 members from the industry, government and knowledge institutes. And today I want to focus on urban clean logistics. Uh, 
the 40 biggest cities in the Netherlands has decided together that in 2025, that's already in four years, the city centers in uh, our city should be totally emission free, which is quite an, uh, a challenge. And it is real public private collaboration, which is the key driver to achieve this. And the way in trying to achieve this is uh, innovation. So uh, imagine that you create hubs at the edge of the cities and that you combine uh, the freight towards the uh, customer or the shop. And other innovation is in uh, legislation, uh, create special time windows for companies who are uh, really sustainable. So they have uh, added, uh, they get extra time slots to deliver the goods and also create special parking uh, lots for those uh, companies. The third one is in technology. And of course, a zero emission light commercial vehicle is the solution and what we are waiting for. They're already there. But, they, but with the zero emission vehicle, also some challenges come. I will address that soon. And the last, uh, how we want to achieve is behavioral change of the customer. All the web shops are competing in, uh, oh, uh, order now and you get it delivered tomorrow or even tonight. But there's, in a lot of cases, no need to have the good that soon. Uh, and the moment you give the uh, opportunity to companies to uh, organize and, uh, their, and plan their operations in a better way, they can do it more sustainable. It sounds good, and we're working hard to achieve it, but we also get challenges. Uh, the typical Dutch city is uh, densely built, and the power grid is based from its origin in a hierarchical way. And there's a lot of renewable energy, uh, so you need a two-way uh, energy grid, um, which is not there right now, and it will cost a lot of money to create that. Uh, because the, uh, sh the vehicles need uh, power uh, to charge their batteries. And then you have another challenge. Uh, the, it, the market for energy in the Netherlands is uh, fully commercial, and there's dynamic pricing. It can be now the case that if you uh, load your batteries in your vehicle, you even on certain times of the day pay more than when you would have put uh, diesel in it. So that is not a very smart way of uh, trying to convince people to become more sustainable. Uh, but there's also, I think, a moral dilemma. Uh, imagine that in 2024, a local shop owner is just one year from uh, his or her retirement. And the government will force such a company, you have to buy now for that last year before your retirement, an electric, electric vehicle. Um, so when the big goals of sustainability meet the individual people, you always will have uh, societal and social challenges. And it is the collaboration again, what we need to solve those challenges. But it can be done because we've shown in the Netherlands that uh, industry and government is willing to collaborate. And that brings me to the final minute. Um, what is it what we de do need the most now? What we all need together is to leave our own bubble and to uh, let go of our own stakes and really start the next phase of collaboration because uh, making cities clean, uh, save the, uh, the health of the people, uh, improve the welfare and improve the uh, well-being can only be achieved by uh, true uh, public-private uh, collaboration. And I'm very happy to share with you uh, other ideas to uh, achieve this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nico. Thank you for <coughs> sticking to your time. Richard? You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Uh, hi, my name is Rich Godwin. I'm a venture partner in Starbridge Venture Capital based just outside of Chicago. And we've been looking at all sorts of different crossover technologies. Uh, we derive ourselves from the space industry initially because I used to work at SpaceX. And then uh, we've been looking at space technologies, but also at the energy sector because space and energy go together very, very well. So because of that, we, we have a very... Um, refined and very broad in some respects spectrum of looking at new technologies because as, as Nico just said there's this move towards uh, new carbon neutrality 
But the fact is you can't just put up enough electricity out there to charge all these cars and everything. We have issues such as, you know, in London, people park on the sidewalk or in the middle of the street. How do you park, how do you charge that car overnight? When you look at um, uh, multiple uh, residential buildings, buildings that have been around for years, these big high-rise plants, they have underground car parking lots or parking lots that are next to them. Who's going to build the infrastructure to be able to charge those cars when you drive home and plug your car in? So we've been looking at other aspects of both baseload and transportation technologies. And one of the things that we've invested in and we're very bullish on is the uh, the readmission, the re-advent of metal air batteries. Now, metal air batteries are about 60 years old since they were first patented, and everyone, the Department of Defense and DARPA, they tried to make them work, and they couldn't get them to really work well. So it kind of got pushed to the back. It got shelved because they couldn't get it to work well. Well, we found uh, some people who can make it work, and we, we financed uh, partially that company. We found uh, ways of making this transportation energy. So what I'm telling you right now is that a chunk of aluminum that looks a little bit like this, except a bit flatter, is an energy transportation device. And aluminum has higher energy density than just about any other type of element except for nuclear. It's it's electric basis. It's much higher energy density than gasoline or <coughs> hydrocarbon fuel. So we're looking at this and saying, this is a technology that's time to come. We've been able to look at it from the standpoint of, you know, we know how to make this work now. So the energy gets transported to the point of use. It is zero emission at the point of use. There is a waste product. It's a liquid, but there is no emission at the point of use and very high energy density. So to top that up, what we're looking for right now from our standpoint is for people to join us in Starbridge as a venture capital uh, corporation to help us to um, become a limited partner to help us to develop and fund these new projects and products that we've been looking at very carefully. And we look at them not only from the technical standpoint, but also from the very clear financial standpoint. And join us in that. Uh, and then eventually we will be rolling out this technology. Uh, I'm hoping that I'll be invited back next year and I'll have some great news because we are developing this. Um, and uh, we do see that this is one of the answers to the issue of carbon neutrality. You can talk about Tesla, very low energy density, fairly long charge time. You can talk about the electrical grid. Where does all the electricity come from? How is it produced? Uh, you can talk hydrogen. Hydrogen has a way of escaping. You know, So there's a lot of fuel cells, things like that. So you have to look at these things. We think with aluminum, aluminum, it, it's, um, it's, it's a... a a product and an energy device and transportation device as time has come. And so we're looking at that very carefully, along with other ideas that we blend in from our space technology uh, background, because this is where these diffusion of innovations take place. Uh, I think it was Matt Bradley, the British writer, said um, that this diffusion of ideas is where ideas go to have sex. And, you know, they, they come up with whole new products out of this. So... That's what we're doing. Thank you, Bill. Uh, so we're looking for LPs to join us in Starbridge uh, to help us to be able to develop these corporations and these uh, innovations. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Again, thank you for respecting the time. Vital, you're next. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, glad to be part of this uh, panel. And um, greetings to everybody listening around the world uh, from uh, not quite sunny San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, my name is Vitaly Golem. I'm a partner at Drake Star Partners, um, where I also lead the North America mobility practice. Um, so this, this topic is near and dear to me. Uh, Drake Star Partners is about 100 bankers across uh, nine offices in six countries. We are uh, the leading year-to-date uh, boutique in, um, in uh, technology M&A, as well as uh, capital raise. We also touch the world of SPACs that uh, is very hot these days. Um, so I work primarily with uh, with vehicle companies and anything that's electric autonomous or any infrastructure for electric and autonomous uh, technology around the world. Um, we are quite excited about what's happening in the world. I've been in the sector for a number of years and it's really heated up in the last year or so. 
as we know, um, and we touch you know not only passenger vehicles but also commercial vehicles, commercial electric and autonomous vehicles that we're seeing out there in the delivery space, either within urban environments or much longer distances. Um, we are also working with a number of companies that are looking at uh, aviation, kind of next generation of aviation, and using cleaner fuels, hydrogen fuel cell, or purely battery electric in the first phases, and there are very you know, many, many different forms of that. And uh, certainly, uh, light mobility is a big factor. Um, in Western markets, light mobility is more of a kind of a, um, a leisure activity, but in, in big parts of the world, this is a primary transportation and something like 44% of miles uh, are driven on two wheels around the world. And uh, there are twice as many light mobility vehicles sold as there are passenger vehicles uh, today. So that's something very important that we look at as well. Um, and a couple of things I want to highlight, um, you know, in our research, uh, government incentives and government regulations have been the biggest drivers behind uh, clean energy uh, pushes. Uh, the technology is still a little bit more expensive, but is starting to get towards par uh, parity. Um, and as exciting as all the developments are and all the new companies that are in space, both in commercial and in passenger and other forms of transport, we're really only at about uh, less than 3% of market penetration compared to internal combustion. So we have a very exciting decade ahead of us, decade and a half in this uh, particular sector. Uh, we're very excited about the new administration in the U.S. and their, uh, their very rightfully placed uh, momentum behind clean energy and what that's going to do to, to the transportation sector. Um, we are actually releasing our annual report on the advanced mobility industry, which covers electric autonomous, um, both electric and autonomous uh, parts of this puzzle. Uh, so if you're interested in that, please reach out to me. I can send you an advanced copy of it. It'll be coming out in a couple of weeks. And generally, um, I'm here to serve as a resource for you. Um, if you have any questions in the space, we're very, very active in all of these areas, we work with companies from kind of venture growth stages all the way to public uh, capital markets and anything in between. So thanks for uh, for the invite. I uh, appreciate being here and looking forward to the conversation. Well, it was remarkably uh, fruitful, and we've got about 20, 26 minutes. I'm going to start this off, um, and I'd like to, when we posit a question, I'm going to open it up for everybody to to quickly respond to other than the initial uh, answerer uh, if you have something on point. But we're going to try and stick to under five minutes on each question. Nico, uh, the world is going to have a huge issue as adoption of, of EVs is going to be reasonably rapid. Uh, there's a lot of ferment. It's going to be an exciting 10 years, etc. cetera. Uh, Vehicles, vehicle, current generation internal combustion vehicles are lasting 10 to 15 years. So it's a global issue. Um, it strikes me that it's going to take a hugely higher level of public awareness, engagement, not just in the Netherlands, but everywhere. I talked to a senior person the other day, he said, oh, yeah, we're going to ship all those vehicles to Africa. Well, the, the atmosphere doesn't care where that carbon comes from, but comes from Africa, it's not going to solve a problem. So I'd like everybody very quickly to respond to, to Nico's conundrum on the persistence of gasoline powered vehicles. Do we have any public policy solutions that we can help him with? Vitaly? Well, it's, uh, you know, uh, focusing more on the U.S., um, what's interesting is we're going to see um, a big catch-up process. Um, as you saw on day one, Biden rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement, um, and I think you'll see quite a big uh, kind of rapid move, <coughs> excuse me, in the U.S. towards this. Uh, the second step, I think, within the first week was an announcement of converting all 645,000 fleet vehicles of the federal government in the U.S. Uh, turning towards electric. Um, you're going to see a lot more incentives coming in, and you're going to see a big rapid catch-up in, in, uh, in the coming years here. So, so incentive, Nico, the, the, the problem for the retiree, I suppose if you make it attractive enough, anybody will make the switch. So it strikes me that uh, uh, government support, government subsidies, 
is going to be crucial to retiring a whole generation of gasoline power vehicles. Richard, is is your technology uh, anywhere near adoption on a wide enough scale that it can disintermediate the trajectory of what we're talking about here? What's your time frame? Um, that's a good question, Bill. And I would say we're not ready for prime time yet. Uh, we have a lot of promise, and we've got a lot of we've got a lot of funding. You know, we're not we're not short of funding for this, and and it's that's both private and public. Um, to get back to what you asked, Nico, in my mind, what I would like to do more than anything, if I lived in a city, I would like to use this as my transportation device. I would like to be able to just call up an automated electric vehicle whenever I needed to go anywhere, and it was there within a couple of minutes. It took me to the supermarket, I get my groceries, and I come back. That, I think, is a potential for coming into play in advanced economies and city centers, possibly more quickly than us having to lay out the electric grid to be able to charge everyone's car. Like I said, if you're parked on the sidewalk in London, how do you charge that car? And so our technology does allow for the negation of of infrastructure because my aluminum fuel, it's a fuel pod, it's a little disc of fuel, like just like a saucepan, it's made of the same stuff, and I could deliver it to you by Amazon Prime overnight, provided you have the power, our power system in your car. Now that power system eventually we think will out just about outperform internal combustion engines. So yes, I think we can compete with internal combustion engines. Are we likely to go there because of the the momentum that's got behind lithium ion? I don't know yet. I will say that aluminum is the second most uh, prevalent metal in Earth's crust much easier to find and it's not geopolitically sensitive like lithium or or uh, cobalt is you know having to mine it in the Congo so I do see the, it's what I call these wild cards we, we all know the safe bets that are coming along we all know what we have to do with the safe bets but it's the wild cards that we're looking for and keeping an eye out to say this dark horse that's over here this could really come out of left field and be, be the game changer and that's what I'm hoping we're doing by looking at these wild cards. But like I said, um, we're not quite ready for prime time. And I would still say that that transition to automated Ubers or whatever, whatever brand you want to use uh, to drive you around town in an automated electric vehicle, I think that's going to change the world more quickly than everybody having a Tesla. Can I make a small comment on this? Yeah. Bill? Is that okay? Uh, I'm... Um If you look at this idea, I uh, I call a car and it's automated and self-driving. It is a possible solution. It's because it is so easy and convenient to use them. But the the space an automated self-driving car is consuming is much bigger than an uh, an old-fashioned car steered by a person, because it is not the physical space the car needs, but the safety and security around the car to make sure that it can intervene with bikers, pedestrians, other vehicles, uh, public transport. Is quite huge, so uh, you will uh, see that the city where you change all the uh, transport to uh, self-driving cars will uh, have a less capacity than in an old-fashioned way. So, I fully agree with you. This is the the future we see ahead of us, but still some uh, challenges we have to uh, to take care of. So, I, I think it will take time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would like the three of you to weigh in on Noman's uh, business plan and do it in a way, you're, two of you are venture capitalists, Nico, you're in and around that world. Uh, how do you react to the breathtaking scope of what Noman recognizes is a huge problem and with a very creative way of thinking about how to solve it? And, and Vitaly, Richard, uh, speak exactly to what Noman is is proposing. Yeah, I mean, I, I can kick it off. Um, I, I just wanted to touch on the last point, I think very importantly, um, 
you know, net net, um, in enhancing public transportation will give us the best ROI period uh, versus making sure that everybody has a vehicle. In fact, in most urban, you know, most dense urban environments, especially millennials, you know, I think the driver's licenses in the U.S. for younger generations are half of what they were 10 or 20 years ago because people don't, they're not out there because they want a car. They want the, the effect of the car of uh, being able to go somewhere uh, on their timeline. So it's very important uh, to think about that. Um, as far as Oman's um, uh, presentation and offsetting, you know, it's, it's a very interesting play. It's very, um, it's very innovative and it, it draws from, you know, even if you look at how Tesla makes a profit for the last four quarters, or five quarters now, uh, they do it by selling tax credits, right? Carbon offset tax credits. Uh, and there's a certain market as kind of a transition, um, transitionary period where uh, different organizations that have this capability, they're able to make this uh, an interesting economic proposition. Oh, where there are that uh, whole term. I'm no, Mike, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm with you. Oh. I think our moderator is having some some problems. Yeah, I am okay. Am I audible now? Nico, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, what Vitaly just said right now about Tesla, you know, making profit out of carbon offsets is absolutely correct. Um, and I think that it's uh, it's going to be incre it's going to be interesting to see if the United States adopts the same kind of carbon offset trading market, which it absolutely needs to do in order to uh, come up to speed with the rest of the world. So I, I think it's admirable to be talking about um, uh, these carbon offsets, which no man has been talking about. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's other ways of integrating the, the, his ideas with some more revenue uh, basis to it as well, as I've seen in some, some places uh, with this idea of carbon offset. Nico, carbon yeah. offset? Yeah, I think this is the, the best step forward to, uh, to change the behavior of individuals and industry. Uh, maybe not a little bit aside this topic, but the European Union will introduce an, uh, a carbon border adjustment scheme. So if you bring in a good from outside the EU into the EU, um, you have to prove uh, the uh, amount of carbon dioxide which the, the product uh, has produced. And if it's more than the product produced in the EU, you have to buy carbon uh, dioxide credits on the European market, which will increase the price of carbon dioxide and creates a fairer competition. So I think those offset schemes really can uh, be very helpful. So no yeah, matter sure. how, do you, how do you relate what you've just heard to what your idea is? First of all, thank you so much, gentlemen, for your expertise and comments. Uh, I see a hundred year plus expertise coming to me within 15 minutes. So it is a pleasure uh, to me. As a startup professional, I always dreamt with working with Silicon Valley people and their thought process matches the startup uh, psyche. What I see is that carbon offset is being taken by two people, either government or the NGOs or the non-state actors or the corporates. But here we are bringing faith in front. We are saying that faith should take care of the carbon offset. And when faith takes care of the carbon offset, it happens from your heart. It happens from your heart and every individual is solely responsible to it. And once it happens, we are giving an, another individual on behalf of that individual $51. So we are paying at the same time we are offsetting. Tesla at that instance is offsetting the carbon footprint. But what is it paying to the planet Earth? It is just giving a climate data bank. But here we are also creating oxygen by planting trees. So that's the differentiation strategy in IOMRA. And the best angle, if we look at it, it is faith for Earth. We are open to all faith. Any farmer or any individual, any corporation, NGO, can be a part of our trillion tree program, which is our CSR. That's the difference between it.
and your your uh, outreach to uh, uh, the major foundations, uh, a Gates, a Rockefeller, um, uh, a, a Skoll, the the traditional big funders. Um, have you have you made a formal presentation to any of them? Uh, we have we have made it to a couple of people in Middle East. Unfortunately, the psyche over there. Uh, is like when we said the early adapters and the laggards. So we were talking to the laggards and the laggards were too slow to understand and then Corona came in. So now I think that we are in the right uh, Californian angle and the Silicon Valley people and we want to wrap it up from here and upscale it. Yeah. Especially if with I can the add the Yeah, if I can add a little comment. Uh, one of my hobbies is behavioral economics. Um, a very nerdy hobby, but this really, you know, this really speaks to the incentives that you're talking about that uh, individuals have and how you're going to motivate them to act. In a lot of cases, when it is a topic like this, it's not a financial motivation, it's something else. Um, and that itself is quite interesting, um, but it is somewhat separate, let's say, from the profit motive uh, of venture, of the venture capital industry. So uh, to get something like this off the ground, you do have to find an alternative way of financing it. Yes, we are just in CDA stage and we are not looking at big funding, but we see the demand and supply gap is so huge and uh, it is going to be uh, addressed towards the whole global uh, planet Earth, not just uh, uh, one particular holy pilgrimage, but people from all across the world go over there. So we are addressing a global community to offset the carbon footprint. We uh the single biggest limitation of harasses is it brings these brilliant people together, and then uh, it, it it proves to be very hard to follow up on a sustained basis with with busyness and different agendas. What forums would each of you say are are the most productive ways to carry forward and to and to uh, you know, talk about talk about these ideas and gain benefit. Is there anything in in uh, Netherlands or Europe, uh, Nico, that you find valuable that Richard or Vitaly might find valuable? Any forums? Well, uh, I think uh, it is to uh, connect to those forums where uh, people really try to become more sustainable. And to give you an example. One of the initiatives of the uh, of my foundation, the Connect Foundation, was to create a uh, program on sustainable logistics. Um, and you have to actually reduce your emissions in an absolute way, uh, even if you grow your uh, your business. And it is a tough goal uh, connected to the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. And uh, there are now more than 500 companies involved, uh, big brands. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the real uh, multinationals are part of this uh, program. And it has extended, it's called Lean and Green. And it has extended from the Netherlands to uh, 12 other European countries at the moment. And it is just uh, recently introduced in Canada. And there you find a community where industry and government are talking together and industry is sharing best practices. Even competitors are sharing best practices between each other because they say we compete on price, profit and promotion, but we do not compete on uh, logistics because we have a common sustainable goal in this. And to connect to these communities, and I will happy to uh, invite you and introduce you, is a way to share the ideas and say, okay, can we by collaboration bring our goal together? That, that, that's helpful. If you could send that to everybody, that would be helpful. Richard, um, I've been involved for a number of years with organizations of uh, Council on Preventiveness, which works closely with the national labs, with the, uh, the U.S. lab structure and the kind of research that they do this is reasonably uh, uh, out there. Uh, needs a lot of development work. Where where do you sit with uh, the government? Uh, that's a really good question, Bill. Um, I would say what I did with this company because one of my good friends 
was my partner on this. He's Canadian, and we tried to get him down here, but he wouldn't come. He's got a big maple leaf on his back. And uh, so he, he stayed up there. So what we did is we, we kept the company in Canada, and we got, we've had huge, huge um, support from the Canadian government. They have been working on uh, uh, their sustainability and, and renewable resource programs. They've really got behind it. So uh, we have had a most phenomenal and fantastic relationship with the Canadian government uh, that we're now trying to translate down here. I will say that the Canadians are kind of trying to copy America like the DARPA or the ARPA type uh, model. And they've, they've said, okay, we need to do this uh, because there are no big Canadian tech companies or innovative companies. So they're doing this very aggressively, and we found it to be a joy to work with them. They've just been phenomenal. So we're, we're going to try and translate that down here. To answer your question about the National Labs, I live just a few miles down the road from Argonne. I have good friends over there. I've been down there and presented a few times. Um, fantastic place, fantastic people. Um, I, I think the one thing I'm concerned about is that the government tries to pick winners because, like I said, those wild cards come out of left field and all of a sudden it's like, where did that come from? And so, you know, the government tends to stick with the safe bets, which I get. I totally get that. They have to, otherwise they, their butt's on the line. But I think from, this, from the standpoint of, uh, of venture capital or private money, whether it be impact investors or uh, angels, venture capital at, at a point, we look at it from the standpoint of, is, is there a return here? Because obviously you're looking for a return. But also, can we make a difference here? We're, we're not your standard venture capital. We're not just, hey, give it, we'll give you money, you give us more money back. We want to make a difference. And so what we look at is not just the financials. We look at the technical aspects of it and then look at the market, the total variable market, and say, what can we do with this technology? that really makes sense for us. You know, is it, is it huge? Is it small? Has it just got applications? So um, that's the way we look at it. We're always, always happy to work with government. And we do have um, friends in DOE, NASA, obviously, uh, and, uh, and in DARPA. So I'm very keen to open up more of those relationships and conversations. All right. Think very hard, guys. Um, we have uh, seven minutes. Um, I've been dominating the question. Think of the blockbuster question for one of your fellow panelists. Raise your hand. Well, maybe yeah. you have some ideas in um, in a challenge you have. What I sense is that uh, on one hand, the government can help with subsidies to change behavior of, uh, of companies, for example. But I sense that when it comes to sustainability, there's a lot of motivation in companies to invest for themselves they don't need external money uh, or they they uh, they get it from a bank but they don't need it from a government but the challenge a company has if they want to change into sustainability is they, that they need a certainty that they do not invest in the wrong technology so for example, when they, for the next year, invest in biodiesel and the next year the government is saying, no, we changed to hydrogen, it is not working. So how can you make the policy where the technology is developing to sustainable in itself in a way that it will not change in two or three years? That is a the challenge. I think. The technology moving so fast, hydrogen is with us now. Uh, what's your reaction? Yeah, I mean, um, there, we have to kind of bracket a little bit. The there's a fundamental difference between how European government um, incentivizes and U.S. government incentivizes. I would say the European government is a lot more prescriptive by the nature of the fact that there's so many members and um, so many cultures and, and differences in the way business is done that you really have to mandate. In U.S., the, the approach has always been more of kind of a nudge and more of um, changing the economic environment and, and incentivizing financially. Um, as far as the technologies, I mean, I, I think, you know, you're probably giving too much credit to a lot of these companies. They're not sophisticated enough to make such kind of low level uh, in a technology stack uh, decisions. You know, they really need commercial ready technologies presented to them for them to make a decision. Now, when the time comes, they can make a decision based on purely arithmetic type of calculations where one technology is more capital efficient than another. 
um, whereas another another technology uh, can be more of a marketing win, right? Which pays different types of dividends to uh, to these type of players, right? So if they can get a, a nice PR win, um, as we've seen with a lot of the a lot of the initiatives around social um, you know social issues in the last couple of years, it's very easy for companies to you know put up something on their Instagram and and basically add, add you know chime in as well on some social aspect and then they look good. It's a very low cost investment for them. Um, you're going to see that also um, happening in uh, in some of these energy fields as some of these technologies become much more mature and commercial ready. Um, you're going to start seeing these calculations both on how it looks, you know, the optics of how it looks when they adopt these technologies, but also they're going to make calculations based on economics uh, for their business. I'm going to give each of you a uh 45 seconds to a minute, just to, to sum up uh, what 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 you learn and what how you propose to act in the future based on this panel. No more. Yeah, uh, it was a great session, and I had a very good interaction with gentlemen, especially from the space uh, side of it and the startup side of it. And I look forward to contribute to. Footprint. Thank you very much, Naman. Nico. Yeah, it's interesting to to hear about Norman about the idea about the uh, trillion trees and uh, and the way the thinking behind it, but also what the others shared about um, the challenge you have in uh, well, you see this great new technology coming and it will come to us, but it's very difficult to implement it right now. And how can we bridge the gap between now and this, all this great new technology coming in a, in a way that we still can move forward to a more sustainable way of operating? And I also agree that uh, there are a lot of companies who do still a lot of window dressing. But there are also quite some companies, and I can, can give examples, which buy cars, electric cars uh, for themselves and done some crazy uh, uh, legislation uh, prevents them from using direction. them. And uh, thanks, Bill. Yeah, yeah. Um, so no, yeah. you're fine, fine, Bill. Thank you. <laughs> I, I think one of the things one of the things I've learned over the years, and certainly it's reflected here in this panel, is that you can have an invention, but to turn an invention into an innovation that changes the world. You don't only have to have the, the technology working right and the money to make it happen. You have to be socially and culturally involved in how that translates across from invention to innovation. If you don't get the social and cultural aspects of a, an innovation correct, it will not be an innovation. It will just be another invention that a few people adopt and it just kind of goes bye-bye. So... I think the cultural and social aspects of bringing an innovation as big as what we're talking about, uh, that, that social and cultural aspect of so me meeting you guys now and thinking in a different way and going, yeah, that actually make, makes sense. Uh, it's not just about the money and it's not just about the engineering. It's about the whole ball of wax in terms of social and culture. Thank you, Richard. Vitaly. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, commercialization is really the key from going from invention to uh, to making this into a big business. And uh, as much as we'd love to think that everybody will do the right thing, uh, unfortunately, we know that economics really drive decisions on a personal level, on a corporate level, on a government level. Um, and there are a lot of different situations, a lot of different environments, and we can't take for granted our own kind of our own environment uh, and project it onto other uh, places. So that's really important to uh, to keep in mind, I believe. And uh, as I mentioned at the onset, I'm here to be a resource. I uh, would love to connect with as many of you as possible. Uh, we'd be happy to share our massive report, about 160 pages, that goes into depth on the current status of this whole sector. So thank you again for having me. Thank, thank you to everyone. We're out of time. We're going to be cut off. Uh, each of you have the other's email, so I would urge you to continue this dialogue in any way that seems most productive to you. 
and I thank each of you for this participation. Stop. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much.